Thank you. So thank you for having me here tonight. I love talking not at students, but talking with students. I'll tell you a little bit about myself. Um, I am the Assistant Vice President of Student Wellbeing at the university, and I wear a couple different hats. One of those hats is supervision of a number of departments on campus. So the university's health services, our counseling and psychological services, our EMU Children's Institute, the Office of International Students and Scholars, and the Diversity and Community Involvement Department, which has four centers, the Vision Volunteer Center, the Lesbian, Gay, Bisexual, Transgender Center, the Center for Multicultural Affairs, and the Women's Resource Center. So all of those departments report to me. On the other side of the coin, and I won't tell you all of my responsibilities, because there's something whenever you get a job, at the bottom of it, it says other duties as assigned. And you'll find when you're in the workforce, there are a lot of those that aren't written out, but you're told this is one of those other duties as assigned. But the other hat that I often wear, that I do wear regularly, is a kind of a dean of students hat. How many people know what a dean of students does, kind of? Or have heard of a dean of students role? Okay, so the dean of students and, and what my role is, is to address student concerns. Um, it might be behavior issues that don't rise to the level of being a conduct issue, but it might be a student that's having trouble academically, trouble socially, um, is having issues in the residence hall. It might be a student that has been recommended, go talk to Ellen Gold about this. It might be a student who was hospitalized for several days, is missing class, and is concerned about missing class. I am the official university notifier to professors so that students never have to give a medical note to a professor that would be a HIPAA violation. And so all of the information goes to me. I communicate to your professors on your behalf without giving any detail of what the issue is. And I support you through that process. I also, the sad part of my job, but someone has to do it, and I think I'm good at it, is if there's a student death, um, I'm the responsible party for the university to express condolences to the family on behalf of the university, to often attend funerals, and help the family process any issues they have or questions about their students' role at the university and what happens now. So I wear a lot of different hats. I have an opportunity to interact with students all the time. I have been here 35 years at the university. I am also a proud alum of the College of Business, having received an MBA from here. My background, in addition, I have a, a bachelor's um, in uh, teaching, K-12 health and physical education, and high school English. I also, from the University of Michigan, and I also have a second master's from University of Michigan in exercise physiology, weird combination. So teaching, exercise, phys, and then business administration. But I learned how to put them all together to have a wonderful job at the university, okay? So given that, um, I'm here tonight to talk about you as students when you first came in you as students now that are making their way through the university towards graduation, and then visioning with you your future as to what is going to happen once you graduate and you move on to potentially graduate school or a job in the workforce. And I'm gonna talk with you about what we consider success or a successful student. What does it take to get you to the point of graduating and then moving on into the workforce. So I'm gonna take you on a journey tonight, but it's going to be a dialogue between us. I'm not gonna do the, all of the talking because I know the journey we're gonna go on, there's a lot that you're gonna be able to add. What I need to find out first in the room is how many of you, if you could put your hand up, are first year students? Okay, a good number. How many of you 
intend to graduate either this semester or by next December. Okay. And how many of you are what I call in-betweeners? Not first year, but not graduating yet. Okay. So we have everyone from our first years to those that can't wait to get that piece of paper in April or December. So this is for you. And what do I mean? This is for you. Anyone sitting in this room can benefit by our conversation. So I want to start out by asking you a question. And that is, what does student success mean to you? What's, what would be the definition for yourself? Yes? Okay, good. Anyone else? Someone else? Give me your definition. And it would help if you could stand because you'll project better if you're standing. And please don't be shy, honor students. Please don't be shy. I'm not one to point at someone, but I could be challenged to do that. Yes? Uh, student success is learning everything you can and getting every possible uh, developing experience for your character and uh, for your career so that you can be as successful as possible in your career and that you do it well, not necessarily that you make the most money. Okay, doing it well, not making the most money. Being successful, you didn't just talk about in the classroom, so out of the classroom as well. Someone else had a hand up over here. If you didn't, I'll pretend that you did. Right there. There we go. Okay, skills that you can learn here and take anywhere. Successful student, being a successful student. Some of the things you wrote down. Tell me something, definition. For you, what does it mean to be successful as a student here at EMU? E, cap, what does it mean for you? Um, I would say Creating the best opportunities for you in the future, no matter what path you choose to go down. Okay, creating the best opportunities, whatever path you go down. You might not even know right now, right? Okay, so being open to that. So, I did some informal research. I collected some data. And I'm not going to read all of it to you, but I'm going to read a few. So I went up to students who were eating, who's like, who is this old lady coming up to me asking me while I'm trying to bite my smash burger, but did it anyway. And so here's some of the definitions that other students gave me. Student success to me means academic success, to achieve good grades, but to also thoroughly learn the material that the grade is earned for. It also means to be able to do something with an earned degree slash immediate ability to be competitive in finding a job. Another student said, student success to me means graduating from the academic program you want to graduate from with the GPA you are proud of. Also finding a job in your field after graduating. Do you know of anyone who has worked so hard academically, get their degree, and have not been able to find a job in their field, in their chosen field? Anyone know of, of anyone who's had that happen? I do. OK. Student success means more than just grades in college. I think that it means everything you get out of it. You gain experience in a bunch of different stuff. You want to have knowledge in your field, and you want to have a full college experience. Just a couple more. Student success means to take education seriously, to try the hardest you can, and to be productive within the community. Student success is doing well in not only education, but maintaining a positive attitude that allows you to grow and to truly learn how to think and form your own opinions. So that's a lot broader, okay? 
Last one here I'll do, student success is not just walking down the aisle to receive a degree. It is learning something in school that prepares you for life and drives you to do what you love. It is knowing with confidence that you're learning something that will benefit your career beyond school. Ultimately, student success is knowing your career before it even begins. Okay? So a lot of interesting different concepts. So what I want to do is kind of take you through the building blocks of when you first came here to college, what it looked like, what you thought about in terms of being successful here at EMU. So I'll take you back. How many students lived on campus their first year? Okay, most of you. So many of you came to orientation. So I want to take you back. Some of you, it just happened this fall, and some of you, it happened a few years ago. Okay? So we're going to go to move-in day, and I call it the meaningful conversation. This is with parents or significant others. And I, what I want to tell you is some of these things I'm sharing with you, every August when students come for Honors orientation. Have most of you gone through honors orientation in the summer? Yep. So I talk to your parents during that time. And I talk to them about the transition for you as students from high school to college. You just got a handout I gave you that gave you examples of the transition in high school to college academically. And there are huge differences that some of you probably wish you knew before you came here, but you're learning now. So, I say to parents, okay, what do you think about, do you think you'll have a meaningful conversation with your student about how to be successful and what to focus on? And, you know, people are raising their hand and they're nodding, and I'm saying, well, when are you doing that? And this is already August. And I said, to help your students acclimate and be the best they can be, please don't wait till move-in day if you really want to have that caring conversation, okay? Because that is your student's day. It's their first day. It's not your first day as parents. Yes, it is, but this is their time. So give them their time. You can do some confidence boosting for them, but again, either have meaningful conversations before you arrive or not. So, I say, you know, I'm thinking back when I brought my sons to college, and the first one I brought, we were helping him move into his room, and I'm kind of an organized person, so they would be bringing the stuff in, and I would start taking it out and putting it in the drawers and everything, and my son was happy as can be because we were getting done quick with that, and he could move on to other things. So I'm like, that's great. My second son, I go with them, and we go to move him in, and things are being brought in, and he goes out to get another load, and he comes in, and I'm putting things from the suitcase and everything in the drawers, and he's like, what are you doing? And I said, I'm helping you move in. And he said, um, can you help me move in and help me get through this without embarrassing me because I don't need my new roommate who I don't know coming in and having you fix the room up for us. So I tell parents, you know, every experience is different and students start their college success career the minute they walk through the doors, okay? So some of you can remember some of that. And at that point in time, what did it mean to be successful your first year in college? Some of you are first-year students, so you can think about it from a perspective of the here and now, and some of you are close to graduating. So what does it mean or did it mean to be successful as a first-year student? What were the priorities for you coming into the university? Yes? Um, for me personally, it was just to get through each day as best as I could, get my feet on the ground, get acclimated, um, meet as many people as I could, and just start to soak it all in as much as I could and not worry so much about what's the next step. Just focus on the right here and right now. 
Okay, so focusing on the present and acclimating to the environment and the people, and it sounds like you being proactive and taking steps to be involved. Okay, someone else, what did it mean to you or does it mean as a first year student to be successful? Way in the back. The thing is being involved you know, all the time on campus. The thing is, I live up here like basically the entire month. And I can't just do this at all. I'm just going to stay there for my new homes all the way back here. You've got to do this if you live your own life, you know, your home now. And if it's your home, you got to be involved in it. You know, if you just hide in your room all day in the outside world, you're never going to have any fun and maybe lose it a bit. Absolute. So getting yourself out, okay? Introducing yourself to people, not staying in your room. What else? Yes. Um. My success story for my, my first year was, I wish it turned out differently, but um, I guess just I thought of college a little too linear. I was just like, all right, this is just what I gotta do. I'm gonna go to, I'm gonna go to my classes and I'm gonna try to get these grades. I didn't even really think about getting involved, especially since I commuted. It's just, I didn't really do a lot besides go to classes, which that was different, but that was my idea of success back then. Good. And it, it is for many, many students that are entering the university. There were a couple other hands. Yes? I'll make sure I attend every class, show up on time, or if I am not able to show up exactly on time, still show up as, on, as close to on time as possible and as discreetly as possible. Um, do honest card deck challenge, get on my gen eds, as many as my gen eds as possible, keep the GPA high so I can get into the program that I want, and uh, connect everything to uh, my major, even if it's a gen ed class, try to do like the assignments if they're open-ended, connect them to what I want to do. Okay. Yes. Okay, so I want to tell you what I also told the parents is that there has been a national survey done uh, across the country, and what they did is they surveyed students at the end of their first semester of college, and they asked them what were the most difficult tasks or difficult issues that you faced as a first-year student. Okay, we've heard some focus on academics and some on getting out. What do you think the top issue was for first year students at the end of their first semester? They're telling us what the most difficult issues were. Yes? Time management. Time management. Someone else raise their hand? There was one over here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, responsibility. Yes. Mm hmm. It was maybe managing your stress and seeing different things, how people manage this, and sometimes you're anxious about it and not knowing how to manage that. Okay. And, yes. For me, it was figuring out what the professors wanted and trying to come up with an organized way to study the material, because that wasn't something that I had to do in high school. Okay. I mean, I've talked about the people in that sort of like common consensus, especially I think with students in the honors college. Being in the honors college, and we found that too, and I, I, I'll tell you the results, the top five in the national survey, but one thing we do find with honors college students is, you know, you are used to coming from a high school environment where you were kind of the cream of the crop, you were at the top. Sometimes you're valedictorians or salutatorians or in the top 
and then you come to a university and you're still that, but you're one of many successful honor students in high school, university or the honor society. And so you're having to fit in with a lot of other students who are as skilled or knowledgeable as you are. But someone hit it on the head when they said, number one issue, first year students, and sometimes second and third year is time management. And what the issue is, and these are things I'm touching on because they feed into student success, being successful. And what first year students told us is that it wasn't that they didn't have enough time. In making the transition, they had more time on their hands than they did in high school. In high school, you went five days a week. Maybe you went from 7.30 to 2.30. You went to every class every day. It was very regimented for you. You had after school X and Y, whether you were in the band or you were in um, a sport or you were in the choir, you knew how your day was going to go and you managed that time because you didn't have a lot of free time. When I talked to the parents, I said, so right now your students are signing up for their classes. And let's say they're signing up for 15 credits. How many hours a week are they going to be in the classroom? And some are saying, you know, they're thinking high school 20, 25. And then we say approximately one hour for each credit hour. So you're in the classroom about maybe 15 hours a week. And 24 hours in a day, when you look at the whole week, you're in the classroom less than one day a week. So what do you do with all the rest of your time? And figuring that out can be difficult. Do you want to work on campus or off campus? Are you commuting and you have a 20 hour a week job? Maybe you shouldn't be working 20 hours a week now that you're in college. Maybe you should drop that down. When are you going to socialize? When are you going to prioritize your study? And then I say about how many hours a week do you think you will be studying in college? How many hours will you need to devote? And students, you know what incoming students say when we ask them? What do you think students say? How many hours a week will they average, they think they need to average studying here in college? Call out numbers. Five? Three? Three? Eight, did someone say one? Wow, <laughs> wow. So what I tell them is the national average is for every credit hour they're taking, they should be spending two to three hours outside of the classroom focusing on their coursework for every hour that they're in the classroom. And people are overwhelmed and students are overwhelmed and it's not every week you have ups and downs the procrastinators will put all of that into one or two weeks, right? Pull all-nighters, got to get this paper done. Do I have any procrastinators in the room? Because I know I am. I, I'm, I'm writing gra grants now, and you know, I have one that's due on X date at noon, and I remember it was like 8.30 in the morning, and I'm calling our grants office saying, I'm almost ready, we'll get it in on time. I'm a procrastinator but I, I do work good under pressure, but not that much pressure, usually, okay? So time management is the number one issue. And sometimes students learn, and we hope that they will learn how to balance that time, because we don't want all the time to go to academics. There are other things you need to be doing and you should be experiencing that I'll, I'll share in a little bit. The second, issue that they said they faced was managing stressors, all kinds of stressors. And one of the biggest stressors, which at first they wouldn't identify, but um, as we talk more, um, one of the biggest stressors is homesickness. Now, if I ask you right now, how many of you your first semester of college experienced homesickness? Are you really all being honest? No one else in this room faced homesickness? 
Usually when I have an incoming at orientation group, I get three to five students that raise their hand. And guess what? All of them are sitting in the front row because they don't know that no one else behind them didn't raise their hand. So they are the only ones in the room that raise their hand and are being honest. Because I redefine homesickness for them and for you as students, even commuter students. Because it's not necessarily missing your best friend or missing your dog that slept at the foot of your bed at night or missing your goldfish swimming until it passed away and you got a new one, okay? <laughs> so what homesickness really is, is missing familiarity of a routine that you've been acclimated to follow day after day after day. And whether you like that routine or didn't, when you make a new transition, like going to college, it can be in some ways overwhelming. You know, that might have been, my father was good at, you know, if I press the snooze alarm for the third time, that means he came in the room and said, you know, get your, I won't say it because I think I'm being, get your think out of, thing out of bed and get to school. I don't have anyone, I didn't have anyone when I went to college to do that for me. So, you know, who cares? Either I get up or I don't. That's on me, okay? But it was the routine that I missed. And even if you were a commuter student, the fact that you weren't driving down the street to go to your high school where you had the same routine, now you had to drive yourself to college and every day was different. And you might be living at home but your best friend went away to college and they're not at home anymore. So you can't do the same things with the same people, okay? So we talked about causing stressors. The third one was um, making new friends or relationships. Some people are good at that, some people are not. You know, you have your extroverts and you have your introverts. And especially more difficult for commuter students because they don't have a built-in community like you do living in the residence hall in your first year. So it's even harder for them to acclimate. So to be successful and to get involved is a lot more difficult for commuter students starting out than it is for those living on campus. Unless you're a student living on campus who doesn't come out of their room. And I know a few of them because they're living in the social media world and anyone they have to talk to, they can um, tweet or Facebook or do whatever. They never have to see anyone. And that's a problem too, okay? So the last two, um, fourth is resolving conflicts. And what first year students told us was the number one conflict. What do you think? Roommates. And the number one conflict within roommates was living with your best friend from high school tragic in many cases. Your best friend in high school, if you want them to stay your best friend, don't live 24-7 with them. A lot of conflict there. The last one out of the five, which is very interesting, was meeting their academic obligations. Because first year students, and we talked about it, you get your syllabus, you know what's expected of you, you know when you have to be class, in class, you know for every date what you have to do, whether it's reading something, turning in a report, or whatever. You follow that syllabus like it's your Bible, and pretty much you'll be okay. So that wasn't their number one concern. Now we see that flipping a little bit when we see you getting to your junior and your senior year, when academics really, really plays into what you think will kind of help to create your success, getting your first job or not. You know, oh, my gen ed courses, so I got some C's and some B's and that's okay. But man, you get into your major field of study, I've got to get A's here. So it transitions as you go through the cycle of being a college student going towards graduation. So transitions, new students, first year students, 
a lot of the issues are just acclimation, getting themselves out, learning how to be a student in a university setting, in a classroom. You saw the handout, you got the handout that I gave you, differences between high school and college. Did some of you look at any of the comparisons? Very, very different high school to college. And when I gave the sheet to parents this summer, they said, are you gonna talk to our students and give this to them? And I said, no, really what I'd like you to do is for you to give it to them so that you read it first and better understand what they're going through and then give it to them to look at. Because what's on there is truth be told. Very, very different than high school. The expectations are different. And it's not, I'll give you, um, for my sheet now, I said I'd be giving you some of the 10 steps to success. Number one on my list is learning how to learn. To be successful, you need to learn how to learn. What do you think I mean by that? Yes. Uh, probably uh, utilizing good paying attention skills. I know I'm a participator, and if I'm not participating in class, then I'm probably not paying attention. Uh, having good study skills, uh, asking your own questions about whatever you're learning and how it applies to you. OK. All of the above. Anything else that someone can think of? This is number one. It's key to being successful as you move towards graduation and employment. Learning how to learn. It's not studying to the test. It's not just reading the assigned pages. It's going well beyond that. What does learning entail? What does it mean to be a successful learner? How do I learn? How do I learn best? So if you don't know, there's four styles of learning. Okay? There's auditory, there's visual, there's written, read, and there's kinesthetic. Those are four styles of learning. You typically have at least one preferred style, and I know what mine is because there were classes that I had to do something different to be successful in learning how to learn. So I'm going to make this easy for you. I've got to watch my time here, too. Um, OK, so you have just gotten a gift. Um, and this gift is in a big box, and it requires you to take it out and put it together, OK? So think about how you work best if you have to put this gift together out of the box. You know, you've got the directions there, and you've got the box with what the final thing is supposed to look like. So what are your options? You can read the directions line by line, step by step, read through, stop and do it, try to do it. You can have someone read you the directions while you try to put the pieces together. So they're kind of your coach. They're coaching you. No, it's part B. It says to put part, part B into part D. OK, and you're listening and you're trying to put it together. The third way to do it would be to look at the picture on the box. And to not read every little word, but look at the visual. Look at the parts and look at how they've shown how they get put together. But I don't necessarily have to read that. And the fourth way is the heck with the directions, the box and everything. I'll just lay all the parts out. I'm really good at figuring things out. And I'll figure out how to put this together all by myself. I don't need anything or anyone. OK? Can you think about in your head which is your preferred way to put that together? If you can, raise your hand if you can think of a preferred way. OK, now let me give you one other example that will key in too. You're going somewhere with a friend. You have never been to this place to visit friends out of town. And so you get directions 
on how to get there. Okay? Now, when people get directions, they do different things. Sometimes you have your partner, anyone watch The Amazing Race? Where, where the person's driving in the car and then in the back seat they're yelling the directions to you. No, it says to go right, go right. No, no, you went left, now we gotta turn around. Okay, so someone's telling you the direction where to go. The second person um, would write every direction. They would hear their friend on the other end, to whose house they're going to, and say, could you say that again? It's Ann Street to turn right on Washtenaw, go three miles, turn left, and they're writing all of this down. The third way someone might do it is to kind of make their some, themselves a visual map. I love that. So I'm not necessarily interested in streets. I go to the first stop sign. On the corner will be a Jimmy John's on the left-hand side, and when you see the Jimmy John's, you turn right. And at the next corner is going to be, it's called the Tower Inn Restaurant. So you'll see it there, and I'm like, I'm on the right track. I just saw Tower Inn Restaurant. Okay, and then I went to the big phallic symbol up in front of the, the, the called the tower, the water tower. Okay, I just passed by there. Okay, so you use symbols and you draw your map that way. And the final way is, you know, you hear the directions once and you're like, uh, I've kind of been there, not exactly to your house, but I think we can get there, don't worry about it. Okay. Do you have a favorite way that you would figure it out direction-wise? Okay. For me, I'm a visual learner. So when I was in the classroom, if we had bit, uh, books or PowerPoints, it didn't matter what the words were on the screen or in the book, I'd always go to the graphs or the pictures or the charts and interpret them first. That's what made me most comfortable. Other people will say, I don't even need to go to class. If I just read word for word what's in the text, I'm fine. Okay, so people have different styles of learning and I know my preferred style, but to be successful as, as a student knowing that, I had to step out of my comfort zone because not every professor teaches in the way that I learn best. So I can't say, you know, Professor Ellen, could you just, instead of um, talking to us, could you like draw pictures for us? So, because I learn a lot better that way. Often professors are going to teach to their teaching style. That's what's comfortable for them. So sometimes for you to be successful, you have to make adjustments and adapt to be comfortable in how you learn. Different kind of learning. Bless you. Okay. So, first year students, you're making the adjustments. Academics aren't the most critical piece of the um, way you acclimate yourself to the university. Now I want to go to the flip side. And I do want to talk a little bit about graduating and moving into your first job, okay? So, I have another question for you. What does it mean to be well prepared for the job market when you're looking for your job? What does it mean coming out of college being successful as a college student, what will you have done or accomplished in order to be successful in your first job search? Yes. You practice the tasks that you do the job and you learn effective like, interview skills and application skills you have with the resume with like internships or just like volunteer experience that you've had in the field before. Okay. So you've hit some key points, uh, you know, the resume and being prepared, but also what you said about it, which was noting internships, other things you have done, opportunities you've availed yourself of, not just in the classroom, but out. How else will you be prepared? How many of you are seniors? So those who are seniors, how are you preparing to go into the job market? What do you do? What are you doing? I'm going to call on you, Kangana, because I know who you are. 
So how are you preparing? Okay. Okay. So you're preparing to go from undergrad into a doctoral program. Okay. So how are you preparing in terms of, have you applied? Yes, I applied to the program. Okay. And what was important in that preparation? What did you have to do? And even think about what did you have to do in applying? Did you have to write essays? Did you have to interview for any of them? How did, how did you prepare? Okay, so I'm going to hone in on one thing she talked about, which focuses on writing. So one thing employers are looking for um, are individuals who can communicate very well in writing. So if you're preparing essays, um, think about the writing piece and what's important. You know, if you have a limited number of words, what do you put in there? What is important to write? You know, yes? I just wanted to add something to that. Mm -hmm. um, always find someone that can edit your paper. <laughs> okay. I applied to dental school last summer, and you had to write a personal statement for that, which was 4,500 words, which sounds like a lot, but when you have to talk about yourself and the things you've been doing for the, all your, not even just college, but even preparing for college, it's not enough. <laughs> But I was lucky enough to hook up with a professor that was willing to spend time reading my drafts and reading my papers and making corrections. And I spent about a month and I went through eight drafts of my personal statement. And I would do it and I would send it to him and he would say, you should change this, this, and this. And I would do that and then he would send it back and say, okay, great, I'll do this, this, and this. So. And don't, yeah, absolutely, don't be shy about getting someone to assist you to read through. I have now become, Jeff Larkham is our university communications director and he writes the news releases and um, all the, you know, the, the emails that go out to the campus community and into the community. And he calls me his red pen sidekick. That's because I did a lot of under, um, in undergrad and then grad school and then in my jobs, I've done a lot of editing and writing. And so even though it might be a topic that I'm not familiar with, he will email me and say, Ellen, can you put the red pen to the paper, so to speak? Because it's always nice to get another set of eyes, another opinion, or say, I don't really understand what that sentence, what you're trying to say, and sometimes you're so familiar with it that it looks fine to you, but someone that doesn't know, doesn't know how to interpret it. So that's a really key piece. So I want to let you know, because I think this is really important, is that, you know, it's, it's the job market's getting harder and harder. There are a lot of jobs, some are specialized, some are not. But <clears throat> there's been a lot of research now on looking at employers and what they're looking for in their applicants for jobs, whether it's an engineer, whether it's a medical assistant, whether it's someone, uh, a journalist. They're looking for things that you're not necess necessarily expecting because as honor students, I know in your head, at least, you come in with, I need to have great grades, I need to be the best in X, Y, and Z in terms of my coursework, because they will be looking at that for my job. But I wanted to let you know, in terms of transitioning for life after college, there are things that you need to really understand that will impact you in a way that you might be sitting here now saying, I need to do a few things differently before I get to my last year in school. So, a study in 2015 by the Association of American Colleges and Universities, they surveyed 400 employers 
big employers, business owners or senior management in large companies, Google, Enterprise, Car, Rent-A-Car, et cetera. They also surveyed 613 college students. And they asked them what were learning outcomes as employers that they were looking for in students. Learning outcomes, okay? And what that meant is they are looking for certain skills that they've been finding of late, they're not finding in their applicants. And they're looking for what they call transferable skills, not just the grades that you're getting in the classroom, okay? So they then looked at, oh, I think 20 different learning outcomes, and I think I'll give you examples. So some of the things that employers were looking for that they gave their college graduates, applicants, low scores in were working with others in teams, ethical judgment and decision making, oral communication skills, written communication skills, critical and analytical thinking, and applying their knowledge and their skills to the real world, beyond the confines of the college classroom and the college environment. And what they did is when they asked employers and then asked students, in every case, the students rated themselves as prepared in that category, and the employers rated college applicants as much, much lower in terms of preparation when they were interviewing them and looking at applications. So as an example, the proportion saying that they are well prepared, employers saying they are well prepared for working with others in teams, 37% of the employers said that college applicants were prepared in that category. Students themselves said that 64% of applicants are prepared. So there's this disconnect. The areas that both employers and students agreed upon, the top six that they agreed were issues that students need to address by experiential learning in college are the following. The ability to effectively communicate orally, number one. The ability to work effectively with others in teams is number two. The ability to effectively communicate in writing is number three. And it doesn't matter what company this is, okay? Number four for them, is ethical judgment and decision making. Number five is critical thinking and analytical reasoning skills. And number six is the ability to apply knowledge and skills to the real world settings. So that's what they're looking for that they believe are lower than it should be and students are in agreement that these are important. So when you're looking at all of this, you know, why learning to learn is important? Because a lot of the learning that you have done and are going to continue to have to do here is combining your in-class experience with out-of-class opportunities. Whether it's something like this, whether you came on MLK Day of Service and went out into the community and worked as a team, with other people, whether you did an internship or you plan to do an internship before you apply for that key job or position you're hoping to get. These are things that you're not going to take a class on, analytical thinking, okay? These are things that you're not going to take a class on but these are things that you have to find a way to include 
in your EMU experience to be a well-rounded applicant, whether it's going on to graduate school or whether it's seeking that first transitioning to an employment. So I want to ask you to, on your sheet, I'm going to give you a second one, and I'm going to ask some people what comments they had on their sheet. Ten steps to success. So the second one I listed that I've had on here for a long time is having a personal vision. What do you think that means? What do you think I mean by that, having a personal vision? In terms of being successful. Absolutely. It's called doing a futuring exercise. Here's where I'm at today. Where do I see myself three years from now or five years from now? So I see my starting point. I see where I want to be. What am I going to do in the middle to get myself there? If I don't have a vision, I could go any direction, any day, any time, and flounder. And it doesn't mean, as a first-year student here, you have to know what you want to be or what you want to do. You have time on that. But you should always be looking towards the future, living in the present, but moving forward into the future. So having a personal vision is important. And most employers, when they're interviewing you, are going to ask you, where do you want to be five years from now? That's not, not something you want to say, well, that's good. I've never thought about that, OK? The time to think about it is now. And it can change over time. That's OK. Third one that I put down was, going with the vision, is developing and implementing a personal action plan. That's number three on the right side on my sheet. So I can think about it, I can vision, I know where I want to be, but again, here it is, that in-between part where I'm starting to develop the plan to get there. And it's not always a straight line, it's not linear. It can go up and down, side to side. The book, The Road Less Traveled, I take The Road Less Traveled more often than I would like to, but it gets me there. It's not always how I expected to, but that's okay because I keep traveling in that direction. I'll give you a couple more, and then I'm going to do something else. Four for me is collaboration and people skills. And that's team building, learning to be a part of something more than myself. And that happens through collaboration rather than competition. And I find that too often students are competing. And when students are competing, sometimes you get what's called the teeter-totter effect. Anyone heard of that? So the teeter-totter effect is, you've seen little kids, or you might have been on a teeter-totter when you were younger, or I might be aging myself because there aren't any teeter-totters today. But OK, so one person is down, and the other one goes up. And then you kind of push off with your legs, and you go up, and the other person goes down. And it's on a playground, and you teeter-totter. And when people are in competition, they teeter-totter all the time, because they think in order to get themselves up, they've got to push someone else down. And that's really the opposite of what you should be doing, because the other method is what I espouse to, and that's called the hydraulic lift. In order to lift yourself up and build yourself up, it's easier when you build someone up with you. Hydraulic lift, you lift someone else, because invariably it's going to lift you as well. So when you're thinking about competition and collaboration, our leaders, our business leaders, are looking for collaborators and people that can be part of a team, even if your job doesn't call for it. There are times you need to become part of a team. 
My fifth one is a strong inner value core that I never shy away from what my core beliefs and values are because then I'm no longer who I am. I'm being someone else to make someone else feel okay. So I always work from that inner core, that belief that I have in my values. And I bring that into everything I do, whether it's personal or professional. So I just want to ask you, as you were writing down some of the things that you listed in your steps to success, what you should be, steps you should be taking for yourself now in school and beyond, give me something from your list. Give me something from your list. Use your resources and don't be afraid to ask for help. Great. Yes. Okay. Participate in class discussions. Okay. Yep. Absolutely. Another one. I'm all wired up. This is crazy. I just put it in my pants. That way I can feel it on both sides here. Okay. What else? Yep, there's one here and then over here. Mm-hmm. Um, time, time to do things that you need to do. Take time for yourself. And not only need to do, but sometimes want to do. Because there's a difference in what you need to do. I have this list that I use for work. And some, most of the time it works for me. I, I've got three lists. I have a gotta do list an ought-to-do list, and a nice-to-do list. And I get in trouble when I start with my nice-to-dos because they're easy to do and I get them done really quickly and then I can pat myself on the back until I realize I still have this gotta-do and it's due by 5 o'clock. But I was making myself feel good because it was something I really wanted to do. So prioritizing. Where else? Here and here? Never forget your goals or your dreams. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's a broad way of thinking, and that's really important. I'd say to seek out enriching opportunities rather than go through the motions. Like, if you're in your first year, I strongly encourage you to get into that independent research because it's way, like, just get the teaching to research, do something because it's way more uh, realistic, more like what you're going to be doing in the real world than just doing a project. Absolutely. And you've hit the nail on the head with experiential learning. It's out of the classroom and things that you sometimes have never done, never would have thought to do. But again, first year students especially, you have to seek out these opportunities. They don't just come to you. And you have to be willing sometimes to step out of your comfort zone to seek those kinds of opportunities because those are the kinds of things that employers are looking for to enhance the academic side. I have hired many an individual in any of my different operations. Any, any, everywhere from doctors to directors of departments to clerical staff to coordinators for programs. And <clears throat> I don't necessarily hire the most qualified person. I hire the most qualifiable person. They can be the most qualified on paper, but there's some, sometimes something special with that person who's basically qualified, but has those extras that we're talking about that will enhance my operation, enhance that person's ability to work closely with students. You know, I tell some people sometimes, you can be book smart, but you have to learn to be more than book smart, which is often what we call street smart as well. You got to be both in this kind of setting, especially in the job market. Anyone else have one that they put on their list that they could share? <clears throat> yep. Go ahead. 
capacities that will teach skills and qualities that will help you in your career? Okay, the volunteerism, developing skills and qualities that will help you towards your career. Okay, so let me give you the rest of mine because some of them are close to yours, some of them are more global, and again, I'm speaking from a different level of experience, and I'm also speaking as an employer, um, knowing what I had to do to get into the workforce. So my number six was having a global focus and perspective, which is really looking both at an international perspective and also from an inclusive perspective so that I am working with people that are different than me. And, um, you know, some people will say, oh, I like this environment because it's a melting pot and we have so much in common even though we're different people. I prefer to look at the differences because I think if we're all common, the same thing, it's a pretty boring environment. So me, I thrive on the differences and being comfortable with them. So that's important to me. And it also is in the work world, in the workforce. My seventh was understanding and knowing how to manage change. Boy, if you work at Eastern, you have to be an expert at this by now because there's things that are changing all the time at the university. And it's not, it's not how it's thrust on you sometimes, it's how you choose to manage it, how you choose to deal with it and accept it and act on it. And then how you can be a change agent as well. So that's really important and important to employers. Um, we touched on this. My next one is experiential learning. So again, don't focus just on one thing. Broaden your horizons, broaden your experiences. You know, it's even to the point where this is an experiential learning, but even sometimes I'll go to the commons to eat and once in a while I'll go by myself and I'll just, you know, go up to someone who's sitting at a table and saying, you know, is this seat taken? And they're kind of like, do I tell her yes? Do I tell her no? I don't know this older lady here, and she's kind of asking if she can sit with me. That's a risk I'm taking. It's a risk that individual's taking. But it's important to accept those kinds of situations and grow from them. My ninth one is taking risks. Be a risk taker. Not all the time. You need to know when it's important to be a risk taker and when it's not. So it's kind of like picking and choosing your times. It's like, uh, I don't think on this one I'm going to go on, out on a limb on this. But then there are other times that like I'm taking it to them. So being willing to be a risk taker. You don't have to be it all the time, but be willing. Analyze, evaluate your situation to determine what your actions need to be. And then my last one is to own your own behaviors. For me, what I say, what I do, what I exhibit, I need to own it. Sometimes I might mess up. I need to own that. If I've messed up, I need to be willing to say, my bad, I messed up on that. And I apologize. But whatever my behavior is, I got to own it because that's who I am. And that's really important for you as an individual, and especially when you're working with other people. Okay? So my list might look very different than yours, but what I try to do is sometimes get out of myself, get out of the small Ellen and what my job is today, and look at the bigger Ellen and what I need to be and what I have the potential to be if I really will just take these um, steps on a regular basis. 
And I think that's one of the reasons I've been at Eastern as long as I have, because I've known when to be a risk taker. I've known how to be a team player. I've known when I need to be an expert. I've known when I need to back down on things. I know when I want to be by myself. I know when it's important to be a team player. All of those things you learn. You're not born knowing this stuff. But as you go through your college experience, these are things you have the opportunity to learn. These are skills that when you move out of the realm of Eastern into your next experience, believe me, these steps will make a difference in terms of being successful. And you will begin to define student success as more than academics, as more than grades, as more than keeping, um, getting your assignments in on time and attending all of your classes. You will think of student success in the broadest realm of who you are and who you have the potential to be and how you can share that when you leave Eastern and go to your next experience. I'm gonna stop right now and because we're getting there on time and ask for any comments or any kind of questions you might have. Yes. Yeah, and that, I mean, that does happen. Those are the kind of students I often see in my office um, because they're not necessarily prepared for the responsibility of being a college student. Again, which is, you know, sometimes we get students here, it's like life in a fishbowl. I'm here and then uh, when I leave college, it's almost like I'm gonna die because I gotta get a job now. But. What we do from the day one that we're here is we need to be working with students to develop that set of skills that go along with being a responsible adult. Many years ago, and you, you wouldn't know this because you weren't around at that time, but colleges used to be what we called in loco parentis. Anyone heard of that before? So in loco parentis is kind of like the university is taking over the role of being the parent for your students, so parents don't worry about it. You know, if they're missing something or they're having a bad day and they're upset, we'll take care of them. You know, if they don't have enough money for X to do laundry, we'll take care of them. And what we are today, we're not in loco parentis, and we tell parents, and I talk to every fast track group that comes in, I talk to the parents, and it's starting next month. And I talk to them about, we see your students as responsible adults. And here are the expectations we set for them. And will we assist them in, in growing and developing? Yes. But we will never let them use an excuse like I'm only 17 or whatever for poor decisions and poor behavior. We'll look at it as an opportunity to educate that young person. Any other comments or questions? I can't take credit for this. It came from one of my roommates, but uh, it sounded like a motivational thing, and it said, uh, remember who you wanted to be. Remember who you wanted to be. So when life gets crazy or tough or whatever, remember where you wanted to be when you first came in. And reevaluate where you're at right now. I thought that was kind of... That's a great point. Great point. I have another one that I 
learned in um, a bias communication training. And it relates to communication and listening. And I really espouse this now. And I tell people that it's really important to listen, to understand, rather than listening to respond. Think about that for a minute. So many times you're in a conversation and you're half listening to what the person is saying, but you're getting ready for your comeback. It's like, I can't believe she's saying this to me now, so as soon as she shuts up, I'm going to tell her such and such. But it's really important before you do anything like that to really listen to understand what the person is saying, is saying, what their intent was, what are they trying to tell you, and maybe they can't, they're not saying it in a way that's clear to you, so you ask for clarification. Too often, we're ready, we're listening, but we're ready to leave the class. So really, did you really listen to understand what I was saying? Often when you're, when you're arguing or you want to make a point, you're always listening to, to respond. I got to come back for him when he's done. So really important, and especially when you're interviewing, don't anticipate the next question. Listen to the interviewer. Listen to understand what they're looking for, what they want from you before you respond. Really important, because people can notice the difference even in your body language and how you reply back. I don't think he, you know, I don't think she really heard what I was saying here based on what she's saying back. Okay, so that's really important as well. Yes. genuinely have a hard time with the material, like who are common students who come to college not prepared for the academic load that they're about to receive. How do you, or how, how do you, like, higher education professionals give these opportunities to students to learn this kind of stuff when, when they're here for their education, but employers are telling them something else? How do you give opportunities to students to balance that? Do you mean students that have come in, are, are you talking about with the employer or are you talking about the students that are? Okay, so I um, sometimes am asked to talk with a student who's really not understanding for many reasons. And, um, you know, especially I found myself talking to honor students who, um, remember one individual in particular this fall who was like overwhelmed by the fact that he was getting a B in the class and it was kind of like a, a life or death for him because he had never gotten anything but A's and he was in the honor society and he was the president of that and he did this that and the other and his mother called me and was like can you talk to him because he's been calling home and he's really upset and um, just so you know what I said to the mother, I can't out of the blue call your son saying, hey, I'm Ellen Gold, and I heard you're freaking out because you're getting a B, so let's talk. Um, but I said to her, you know, if you're that concerned and you're talking to him, say that you know of a person who would be willing to sit down and kind of evaluate where he's at, where his priorities are, and um, what kind of support does he think he needs as well as what we can do for him. Sometimes students aren't ready. You know, sometimes no matter what you do, they're not ready to be in this environment. And sometimes we have to say that as well, that it might not be the best fit right now. And I've had to do that too. I've, I've already done it this semester with a family. Um, so again, part of it is working with the faculty, but I will always say to the parent, before I can make contact with your student, I need you to let your student know that I am going to be contacting him and who I am. Otherwise, I, I just can't do it. Um, but you, if you have the opportunity, let's say you're, you're a mentor. Let's say you're a mentor to a student like that. How would you, any of you, as a mentor, work with that student? 
What would you do? Mm hmm. Oh, people that don't know that? Okay. 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 Okay, that, that's an easier one than having to deal with the parent. Um, first of all, one thing that we're going to try to do is put together a um, much more defined resource list for incoming students. And that's something that if I'm asked to come back for honors orientation, I would bring with me as well. Because not only do I think students need to understand all the resources available to them, parents need to understand. Because what I say to parents is, if your son or daughter is living at home, or they make contact to you saying, I don't know what to do, I just you know, failed this writing, um, I got a zero on this writing paper, or I got a 40, I said, you as a parent need to know the resources here so you can advise that student, did you go to the writing center? Have you talked to so-and-so? So I talked to parents about surfing the, our web to find out sort resources, and I also provide them with a master list of resources, not just academic, but um, student engagement resources, whether it's volunteerism and opportunities there, whether it's social events, whether it's student orgs. So I think all of us collectively better understanding our resources and being able to um, provide the needed resources to that individual would be something that we need to do better than we are right now. Did that better understand? Yep. Maybe versus right. And we do have those students right now, and we have students that are homeless that are told to contact my office as well, and um, that are having trouble living in the moment. And absolutely, it's hard for them to see beyond, you know, where am I going to get my next meal? Um, where am I going to crash? Whose couch am I going to crash on next? And I think for us, with a student like that, when I meet with that student, it's really what we've done as a university in some of our areas. We, work, we now work in a case management mode. So the one thing that's good is instead of sending a student around to five different offices to answer questions or get information to help them, someone like me or someone on my staff will case manage. Um, and I do this especially for students that have been hospitalized. So who's the social worker? Um, let me contact housing so that they know what's going on so I can assist. Are the parents involved? What do I need to let faculty know so they can better support this student? And I don't give anyone more information than a student wants me to give. But we work in a case management mode. So what does this student need to not just get by today, but make it at least through this semester. And I, <clears throat> last summer, called a list of students that um, were provided by um, the admissions office who hadn't by June registered to return. A lot of them, it was financial. So what I did is I worked with the financial aid director and said, can we give a short-term loan to some of these students to get their um, balance due under $1,000 so they can register and at least know that they can get back into school, and then let's work on what other kind of financial resources we can provide for them. But that's, that's really important. And it's so important when a student's in need to not bounce them around the university. And that's what I and some of my colleagues are trying to do now to, to make a difference in that way. Anything else? Questions or comments? The other thing I want to ask you before we, we go is, how many of you have utilized the Career Devel Development Center? 
And in what way have you used it? Career Services, Career Development Center. How many people have used it? Anyone else for, for what reason? Okay, you touched on a key point. As we move some of you that are in your last year moving on to graduation, um, our surveys tell us not at Eastern, but nationally, career service centers are being underutilized. They're a key resource. You might go in to see what your work style or, or social style is and do what people call Myers-Briggs, but when it gets into really looking at your resume, really looking at doing mock interviews, most people aren't utilizing the services that are available at the university, and employers note that, like, that person wasn't ready for an interview at all. I had someone that interviewed to be my administrative secretary, and she came in wearing um, frayed jeans, a gray hoodie sweatshirt, carrying a plastic bag, I think, from Myers that she had a tutti frutti drink in during her interview, and she didn't even look like she was ready to interview, let alone ha had the tools to interview. What are people looking for when someone interviews? I look as much as, at your body language as I do listening to what you're saying and how you're saying it. And if you've never practiced it, it can be your downfall when you go to interview for a position. It's okay to practice, it's okay to screw up, but do it when you're working at it. Don't wait till the interview to have it happen there. Be prepared for the unexpected. And we do that in mock interviews. And that happens for grad school too. A lot of, a lot of grad schools require interviews for certain um, schools of study. So it's never too soon to participate in mock interviews. Saunders College do that at all with the students, graduating students, do you know? Have you ever thought that. that's something that would be fun to set up? Mm -hmm. What we usually do here, and we do it for a couple of the um, undergraduate programs going into graduate programs, is we get some of our directors and our staff who are willing to be interviewers and um, set students up in interviews and they have to bring their resume and we look it over. That's the other thing is, you know, what are you putting in your resume? What aren't you? Who's telling you what's best to put in it or not to put in it? If you've never talked to an expert in the field, do that. And we have a center here that you can utilize. I know I think we're kind of almost past our time here. We're at our time. I will stay for a little bit, and if someone wants my card or wants to talk to me one-on-one -on -one at any time, I would be happy to do that. But thank you for your attention.